a couple minutes, everybody, and we're going to get all of our uh, attendees joined in here. And uh, my name is Gwen McGill. I'm the executive director of the Santa Lucia Highlands Wine Artisans Group. And um, we're going to turn over to Tony Baldini. Hi. Good afternoon. Welcome to Win. Good afternoon. Welcome to Win Wine and Sun. It's a, a virtual happy hour. We're going to go behind the scenes and meet some of the growers, vintners, winemakers, personalities behind the wines of the Santa Lucia Highlands and learn about what makes them special. I'm Tony Baldini, president of the Santa Lucia Highlands Wine Artisans and president of Han Family Wines. I'm talking to you from our deck in the Santa Lucia Highlands, about a thousand feet over the Salinas Valley. Most of you might see me in most years behind a table in Marisolet where winemaker Paul Clifton and I are pouring wines. Unfortunately, that's not happen happening this year, but our mission still continues. A mission to raise money for, for local uh, organizations in need, and also our mission to continue to educate people on the wonderful Santa Lucia Highlands wines. We're still doing, doing that this year, but in a, a different format today. So this year, of course, there's an online auction. I hope everybody gets on and, and bids on those wines. There's some incredible one-of-a-kind lots, including our Lucienne wines and our orchestral Pinot Noirs as well in there. Uh, but get on there and, and bid up those wines. And some of you may not know that as part of that education, we're engaging sommeliers from around the country. We're talking to them in, in Texas and California and New York, and they are on the front lines for us in many ways, educating people on what makes our wine so special. They're out there talking in restaurants every day normally for us and doing that. But however, many of them are, are of course, struggling with the, uh, the shelter in place orders and all the restaurants that have closed. So this year, our uh, por portion of our auction proceeds will be going to the United Sommeliers Foundation to help those, those folks in need. And this, they, they truly need it at, at this time. So um, again, for the next hour, we're, we're gonna go through some of the, the great highlights of, of, of the Appalachian in the area. I'm gonna turn it over to Chuck Wagner at Marisole for, for a minute. Um, but our organization, as you may know, has been around for almost 30 years. It was founded by uh, local growers, Nikki Hahn, the Talbots, the McFarlands, and many others that got together and formed an appellation in one of the most you know, special and reserved uh, Pinot Noir and, uh, and Chardonnay growing areas in, in the world, we believe. So uh, thanks very much for tuning in today. And I'm going to turn it over to Charlie at this time. So Charlie. Thank you, Tony. Uh, hello, my name is Charlie Wagner, winemaker at uh, Marisole Winery. Um, we have hosted the event at our winery, I think the past seven, eight years. Um, and uh, it's been a joy having everybody that has participated in the past and hopefully some newcomers in the, in the very new future, uh, very near future, we hope to see you soon. Um, what I love about the festival is we get to see all of the local winemakers, all the local growers, local people, and um, some of the local purveyors of, of fine food. It's such a great event. Wish we could be holding it this year uh, at the Marisley Winery, but we'll cross our fingers for the future. I wanna give a shout out to the local restaurants and uh, food purveyors uh, that participate and hope to see you all next year. Uh, up next is uh, Master Som, uh, Master Som Bob Bath with Tolosa Winery to show us what's going on in the vineyards and in the winery. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Charlie. and. Uh... Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being a part of this today. My name is Bob Bath. I'm in-house master sommelier for Tolosa Winery. Uh, and Charlie, I just want to let you know, I just had a bottle the other night of the 2011 Grenache Blanc for Wagner family, holding up great after nine years. But uh, Tolosa Winery actually is not part of, of the San Lucia Highlands, but we are very fortunate to get some fruit from Gary and Nick from the Apex Vineyard. So part of what Tolosa Winery bottles is a vineyard designated Apex Vineyard Pinot Noir. And that, explains part of the connection uh, that we have with this region, but I want to tell you a couple other connections. The owner of Tolosa Winery, Robin Baggett, was born and raised in Salinas, California, still calls that one of his homes, and I have a very strong connection with this region also. Uh, my wife actually grew up in Monterey, and I was very fortunate to live in the area uh, from 1986 to 1990 when I ran a restaurant called the Sardine Factory in Monterey, working with Ted Ballesteri and Bert Catino, and of course Fred Dame. We had one of the great wine cellars of the country at that point in time. And it was a very exciting time in terms of, of really the San Lucia Highland, Highlands Appalachian, uh, which would become formally an Appalachian in 1991. 
Uh, the wines then, we felt like we were on the cutting edge, not only sharing them with customers, uh, but really learning about the, the greatness of this appellation. So it's great to be back here today, kind of sharing some wonderful memories. Our first child, Natalie, was born in Monterey at the same time too. So 32 years ago, this is a long thing. A lot happened in 32 years, but we're, we're gonna see really up to the minute today in terms of what's happening in these vineyards themselves. We've got a series of live updates from the vineyards and from the wineries themselves. And we're gonna to go to the vineyards first uh, and talk with Mark Pizzoni and Steve McIntyre. And then we're gonna be going uh, into the wineries and talking to Paul Clifton and with Gary and Nick Francioni. So we get up to the minute updates of what's happening in these vineyards. It's a very exciting time in terms of the vineyards right now. And they're probably a little less affected by COVID-19 in terms of what's happening. They're still growing away and, and really good thing COVID-19 can't affect the grapevines if you think about it. But we're going to go to Mark Pizzoni first. Uh, and, and Mark, I can still remember 25 years ago, my first Jeep ride with your dad. I think my heart is still in my throat, as a matter of fact. It's one of the most exciting rides I've ever had in my life. Even then, though, I knew the greatness to come from this vineyard. But I know you work a lot in the vineyards. You've got some exciting things to tell us what's happening in the vineyards. Off to you, Mark. Thank you very much, buddy. I appreciate it. It's always an adventure with my dad in the vineyard. Um, again, I'm Mark Pizzoni. I'm the farmer of our family. My brother, Jeff is our winemaker. And my dad, Gary Pizzoni, planted the first grapes at our Pizzoni Vineyard in 1982. It's a very special piece of land. I absolutely love my job and I love sharing what I do. Right now I'm standing in the middle of our insectary, which is maybe a two to three acre plot of land we set aside to plant all native California plants uh, designed to bring in beneficial insects. This helps me bring in good bugs, and these good bugs increase in strength and spread throughout the ranch and help fight pests in the ranch. Um, a way that I can be a better farmer, work closely with nature, and be tied into the land, and ultimately uh, take better care of our ranch and make better wines. Where I'm standing, we're about 1,400 feet in elevation, just over the ridge from Big Sur, next to Monterey and Carmel. San Lucia Highlands, I absolutely love this appellation. Um, and it's fantastic for growing cool climate grapes for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. It's windy, it's cold, it's foggy, very moderate summertime temperatures. Um, it's one of the best spots in the world for growing grapes. And I'm fortunate enough to be a farmer in this area. As a farmer, I want to give you a quick update of what's going on in the vineyard right now. Um, it's springtime in the Appalachian. And spring is one of my favorite times of the year. Uh, the vines become alive. The hills are painted with native uh, wildflowers that are blooming, um, and it's a grand growth period in the vineyards. So vineyard shoots are growing rapidly. Vineyard shoots are now maybe 24 to 36 inches, and we're in the middle of bloom or flowering, which is a very critical time in the vineyard. And bloom is when the little tiny grape clusters are beginning to form. You have little flowers that develop on these. Grapevines are self-pollinated, -poll self and when these grapevines, when these clusters pollinate themselves, you begin seeing little tiny berries beginning to form. Very critical time, especially in the San Lucia Highlands because it's so windy and it's so cold. It can, uh, these difficult temperatures and wind conditions can affect our set and ultimately our crop levels. Um, we hope for the best. Um, and now I just wanted to say thank you guys for welcoming me into your guys' home. Thank you for wanting to know more about our vineyards, about the Appalachian, and for celebrating the Santa, Santa Lucia Highlands with me. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Steve and Kristen McIntyre. Mark, for that introduction, and it is great indeed to be with all of you today, virtually that is. Uh, this is not a virtual background behind me, that is my hair blowing in our a uh, famous uh, Santa Lucia herbs, which is so important to so grape growing. Uh, I want to welcome you to our state vineyard here in the Highlands that was in 1972, and now is the oldest, uh, one of the oldest blocks of Pinot Noir in the in the county. Uh, it's going strong. It'll do well. We're looking forward to making a 50-year vintage wine out of it. Uh, so uh, again, welcome and enjoy. This uh, uh, symposium today, if you would. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what's happening in the vineyard. Mark did a great job of talking about bloom. Well, you know, bloom's a funny thing in a grapevine. I'm holding up the slide. I don't know how well some of you can see this, but it's, it's, in, it's flowering right now. And if you were to smell it and 
walk into a vineyard that's in full bloom, you'd notice the subtle sweet smell. It's it's a it's unmistakable once you learn what it is, and because uh, a lot of folks don't think these flowers have any fragrance. The other thing, as Mark indicated, is they're asexual, so they have both male and female parts in them, and don't require other insects to help them fertilize. So I guess the correct pronoun would be them. But at any rate. Um, I also wanted to touch on some things we're doing that are a little different in the vineyard. A number of years ago, Dr. Cook from UC Davis and Far Niente Winery teamed up to look at high scoring, um, sorry, Matt, Wine Spectator scores. They looked at high scoring Cabernet uh, vineyards from the Napa Sonoma area. They sequenced the DNA from samples of grapes from those vineyards. And they noticed that in sequencing it, that there were particular bacteria and fungi characteristic to higher scoring. So um, we've taken it one step further. We're not only looking at the DNA sequence from the grape, we're looking at the DNA sequence from the ground. Um, that our farming techniques, we're experimenting with different farming techniques to see if we can influence the bacteria, not only on the grape, but, and this is bacteria, fungi, and viruses, uh, but also in the soil. And uh, I think that this is a, a new frontier. I know that Oregon State is working on it and the Oregon Wine Board is funding that. So uh, it's, a, it's a promising field that could actually show or maybe, you know, the biodynamic folks are right. This will be the chance for them to, to show that. Um, so at any rate, we're glad it's not too windy today and the tripod's not falling over. And I'd like to hand this back to Bob Bath. Hey, Steve, thank you. And it's uh, it's amazing to think that we've got a little over 6,000 acres with some of the best DNA on the planet. And I, I think so often we think about grapes and today we're learning about insects, we're talking about microbiomes, we're talking about yeast and fungi. And really all of it is that, that inherent signature to Santa Lucia Highland wine and that can't be copied anywhere else. And I, I love that idea that we're really taking this concept of terroir and taking it a step further and knowing that there is something unique about this place. I think most of you have tasted that uniqueness in the wines. And, and with that, we're gonna go right out into the wineries themselves and kind of get some update in, in wineries who probably in many ways have had more challenges just in terms of coordinating staff and, and, and perhaps uh, multi-purposing staff in terms of that. And I wanna talk, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and have you meet Paul Clifton and, and Gary and Nick Francioni from their wineries. Paul, we're going to go to you first at Han Winery. I know you farm over 12,000 acres, but tell us a little bit about what's happening in, in the wineries themselves there at Han. Yeah, we um, yeah, 1,200 acres, not 12,000. That would be a pretty big mission for us. But um, yeah, so in the winery, you know, we're busy right now. We're uh, racking barrels, we're putting blends together, bottling, We've had, you know, with this, uh, the COVID thing, we've had to create, you know, we've got about 20 people in production up here and we've had to separate people out um, into teams and in different zones and um, staggering shifts. So it's been, a, it's been a challenge, but uh, it seems to be working very fluid. Um, you know, we're standing, uh, Tony and I are sitting on the deck of the tasting room, which on a Saturday afternoon would normally be packed. Well, we, uh, we ended up having to shut both tasting rooms down here at the estate as well as in, um, Carmel. And uh, so typically our tasting room staff is also working the gala. So I thought it'd be a good opportunity to, to share with you guys uh, what our tasting room staff is doing um, right now. Hi, Daniil. Hello. I was just telling uh, folks that uh, you know that we had to shut down the tasting rooms, and we want to find out what you're up to out here. Well, today we are shoot thinning in our Smith Vineyard Pinot Noir. Um, it looks like they actually moved up some of the wires here so that the vines weren't so spread so far apart and grown out. So um, it's been a little bit more interesting trying to get to the to the picking. Um, so it's been it's actually been a very fulfilling experience because I've never done anything like this before so it's been a lot of fun. So how long have you how long have you and the team been out here? Uh, since April 1st. Yeah we've been out here for a few months now.
So how many acres are you, you uh, are you guys working on, you and the team? So out here in the Smith Vineyard Pinot Noir, we're doing about seven acres. And then up top above our uh, tasting room, we have Chardonnay that's about four acres. Is the Chardonnay ahead of the Pinot in terms of growth? Um, I'd actually say from the looks of it that the Pinot seems to be thriving more. Okay. Um, it seems like the, it gets a lot thicker, especially with the leaves. Yeah, and what's uh, like when you first start out here, what, what are the differences between six weeks ago and now? It was actually incredible seeing the growth process and how fast it happened. So coming out here when we very first started shoot thinning, I remember my thumbs being a little sore at the end of the day because we were picking out all the doubles and uh, they were just so small, little itty bitty. And uh, then we come out here six weeks later and literally we're searching, literally <laughs> rummaging, <laughs> trying to find what to pick. So it's kind of more like a jungle. Huh? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you guys are kind of wrapping up, uh, shoot thinning in the, in the final few rows. Um, what would happen if, if we didn't do the shoot thinning operation that you're doing? So I, what I started to call it was survival of the fittest. So basically you want to be able to have the, uh, the room for the grapes to grow. So if, a one, if there's a stock that grows into a double and one's thriving more than the other, even if one has a smaller amount of, uh, has grapes on it and it's, but it's smaller, you want to pick that one. So basically you want to make room for the grapes to get the sun and the wind and the weather that you need in order for it to grow and taste the way you want it to taste. Yeah, that sun's very impactful to uh, how, the, how the color of the, the grapes get. Mm -hmm. And then the wind with the texture and, and what it does for the, uh, the flavor. Right on. Well, after you guys wrap this up, um, I'm not sure if the tasting room will be open or not. But um, if it's not, then you'll continue on and uh, we'll start leafing. Leafing. And that's, uh, that'll open up even more of uh, the canopy to sunlight and wind. So. Oh, absolutely. I feel like I've been trying to work on that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so feel well, we kind of got to now. It's getting like jungle. <laughs> the ever important San Lucia Highlands color and texture and Pinot Noir. Right on. Well, thank you, Daniil. No problem. All right, with that, I will turn it over to Gary, Nick, and Scott over at Roar. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for sharing that cool video. I'm here. Uh, my name is Nick, and this is my papa friend, Shoni, Gary over here. Uh, my brother, Adam, is, is also on the call as well. Uh, and, so, and Scott, our, our winemaker as well. I believe is is tuning in as well and and enjoying some some of the cool video feature that that we put together for you guys. Uh, so we're we're covering the blending side of things, uh, which is what we're going to go through the entire process here. Uh, and wine blending is is a very interesting part of the process. Uh, the, the to give you a timeline of how wine is made, uh, we we pick our fruit in September. Generally, sometimes that'll roll into October, uh, and then we we do our fermentation. You know that lasts up to up to about a month. Uh, it'll then go into barrel. It'll be in barrel for usually about another half month to another full month. Uh, it'll then go through malolactic fermentation, uh, and then that will complete after some time. And then usually around March is, is when the wines actually start to soften. And, uh, good. Uh, and so from there is, is when Scott and I start to approach each, each and every single barrel. Uh, we taste through just about everything and actually everything. Uh, and then once we do that, we, we put together a bunch of different uh, combinations of the wines. And so uh, we'll be able to share the video here and, and just take you through that entire process. Uh, the, the blending process, is was... we're going to share the video first. Okay. Uh, Gwen, can you share the video? This is fine. Yes, you, you. Hey, uh, Gwen, we can't hear. I think you're muted. The Roar Winery. My name is Nick, and I'm Scott, and we are here today to talk about blending. Now, blending is the artsy and crafty part of the winemaking process, and it's really when we put the wines together in the final blend. It's also got a lot of moving parts. Each of our vineyards has different blocks, and we ferment them separately, and each of those separate fermentations goes into several different barrels. So we need to taste all of those and come up with a blend that really expresses the vineyard in the best possible way. So Scott and I have been working tirelessly for the past couple months. Maybe not tirelessly, but we're still standing. <laughs> and so we are going to take you through how we go through that blending process. We 
start by tasting through every barrel to assess for quality and unique expression. Each barrel brings something different to the table, like spices in a cabinet. Then we create initial blends from each block or clone, taking notes all along the way. Now that we've created these lots from the different vineyard blocks, we taste and again assess them to interpret how they might contribute to the overall style and nuance of the wine. Each clone within the Pinot Noir family has a unique profile, ranging in mouthfeel, fruit expression, aromatics, and structure. We use a variety of precise measurement tools to blend these individual blocks together in order to create different versions of a vineyard blend. Now we have our initial blends. We taste them blind so we don't play favorites. No way, mine's better. Uh -huh. Anyway, we compare them side by side looking for complexity and expression of terroir. Hmm, I like the structure, but does the fruit hold up? Pretty good, just a little out of balance. It's always important to take meticulous notes. Yes, Scott, and don't forget about the real notes. After tasting and learning from the first round, we modify and fine tune the blends to try to take it to the next level. Every subtle change can make a big difference, and there are countless permutations for any given blend. Sometimes it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. What am I missing? Okay, let's reset. Blend, taste, repeat. Blend, taste, Repeat. What is he doing now? Maybe a different technique will work. Okay, let's go. Could this be it? I really like it. I love it. Well, Scott, I think we found our blend. One down, five to go. Best vintage ever. Cheers, cheers. <laughs> All right, um, thanks for, for sharing that. Now that we've heard two Franchonis cuss in one video, I think it's time to hear them speak again. <laughs> Um, yes, so the blending process is often an overlooked, um, but trust me, it is a tough job of trial and error to find the perfect blend each vintage. Uh, it also helps us in the vineyard when the time comes to plant and graft vines. For example, uh, we're trialing right now field blends in the vineyard where sections of a vineyard are planted with numerous clones of Pinot Noir and harvest it together to create complexity of the wines. So we appreciate the tireless days and evenings that Nick and Scott put together to find a perfect blend. As you saw, we just finished blending our 19s and the wines are true to the Roar style. And we can't wait to show you in 2021 at the next gala. Um, as in, when I say Roar style in 2001 when Roselle and I, um, wanted to start making wine, we, we wanted something that we would love every day, or every glass that we drank. And um, we wanted that to be consistent over many vintages. The, that's what's great about SLH. And I've always said that at least nine out of 10 vintages, maybe even nine and a half out of 10 vintages are so consistent because of our cool weather and cool climate and a long growing season. And I really firmly believe that. And we enjoy sharing these wines with you. Um, in that video, it was just Scott and Nick, but we really have a team, including Adam Lee, myself, Rosella, and Adam Fran, um, who, who, who participate in all of this. But it was a real fun video, and I'm proud of Nick, what he showed everybody, and uh, can't wait to do the gale in 21. Love you, bye. Thanks to, to all, the, all the participants and coming out and, and showing love for the SLH. Um, we love it as, as much as anyone, and um, it wouldn't be anything without the people who enjoy and, and love the, the wines from the SLH. Uh, so thank you all for, for, for coming and for, for enjoying uh, you know, what, what we have to showcase from, from our wineries. And I'll pass it back to Bob, of course. Thanks, Nick. And uh, as a master sommelier, I, I think I'm very fortunate to be on the receiving end of well, finished wines. And I have to tell you, one of the most humbling experiences of my life was trying to blend wine. It is something that looks effortless and with the great terroir of, of San Lucia Highlands, you'd think it'd be easy, it's not. And this is really a, an art form in terms of what they do. But more than anything, I, I, I wanna thank Mark, I wanna thank Steve, I wanna thank Paul, and I wanna thank Nick and Gary for these incredible insights into what's happening in a truly dynamic, uh, Appalachian. And, and from here, we're going to be going to Matt Ketman with the wine enthusiast. And he's got some very special guest winemakers uh, to share some really interesting question and answer sessions with you. Thank you, Bob.
That was a uh, great uh, roundup of what's happening in the wineries right now. I can't wait to see uh, the Roar guys start their own film company. That was great. <laughs> um, I am Matt Ketman. I am a contributing editor for Wine Enthusiast Magazine. I cover the Central Coast uh, for the magazine as well as Southern California. Um, you know, I'm originally from San Jose, uh, fifth generation San Josean, but, you know, went to school at UCSB and also had uh, relatives in Southern California. So I would drive up and down 101, you know, since I was a, a young boy um, and really always kind of would look to the right and think, what are those vineyards over there? You know, and so it's been a, a great opportunity uh, in this job, which I've had for six years now to um, use that as an excuse to go meet all these great people, explore these really unique uh, places, uh, you know, on the on the, the mountains there um, in the highlands and uh, to just really enjoy the wines and really get to know the region. So. Uh, I've become um, pretty friendly with with a lot of the people on this call, um, and it's really exciting uh, to be doing this. So thank you for having me. Um, we have, uh, you can't talk about the San Luis Highlands without talking, obviously, about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And so we have a couple of those wines that we'll try uh, first from, from Talbot. Um, they uh, sent us some wines from um, their Sleepy Hollow Vineyard, which is uh, one of the northernmost uh, vineyards um, uh, in the Appalachian, uh, so closest, to, you know, one of the closest to the ocean. Uh, it's about 500 acres, and it was planted, uh, the bulk of it was planted in 1972, which makes it one of the oldest, if not the oldest, um, you know, uh, vineyard in the region. So um, there's some really cool stuff going on there. Um, so we have a Chardonnay from there. This is a 2017 from the San Lucia Highlands, uh, the, the Sleepy Hollow Vineyard. Um, you know, it's, what I like about the Chardonnays from San Lucia Highlands is that uh, they're, they're very plush. Um, they can be very full of fruit and, and ripe flavors, but then there is that just persistent acidity um, that's kind of the hallmark of the region and of any kind of cool climate region that really keeps these wines uh, in check and allows you to have these bigger flavors uh, yet be in balance. Um, so I'm gonna take a sip of that. Yeah, really, really nice wine there. Um, and then the other uh, wine they sent also from Sleepy Hollow Vineyard is the 2017 Pinot Noir. Um, from there. I believe some of these wines are actually in the auction um, that's online right now too, maybe in larger format. So um, so this is the Pinot Noir. And again, you are allowed because of the climate and the wind, you know, and as you can see from those other streams, the wind there is persistent um, and a really, I think, limiting factor for the grapes in a good way. You know, it makes them struggle and, and makes them interesting fruit, um, kind of like the Chardonnays, the, the Pinot Noirs from San Jose Islands can also show uh, fairly big, um, you know, ripe flavors. Um, but then the, again, there's that acidity cutting through it. You also get a nice kind of spice rack um, and a peppery, peppery spice to a lot of these as well. Um, and then you also get, I, I always find a sense of um, almost like loamy soil. There's, there's some, some earth character, I think, to these Pinot Noirs, and it's especially true on this one. So, I mean, that's, many people know about the Chardonnays and Pinots of San Luis Highlands. That's like, you know, the bread and butter for the region. Um, but I'm excited to try what we have coming up here with the two next wine, Mike, because they're not Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Um, we have Dennis Hoey from Odonata Wines, who's going to share a sparkling Riesling of all things, which is, which is awesome. Uh, and then one of his Rhone blends. Uh, and then after him, we're going to go to uh, Viviana gonzalez Rave from Catalea Wines. And she's going to show us a couple of Syrahs. Uh, which I think are really interesting because they have some age on them. One of them does in particular. And, uh, you know, Syrah is, Cool Climate Syrah, I think, is maybe the most fascinating grape in the world. Uh, and I've tried some some older ones from the San Jose Highlands numerous times. Adam Lee has sent me some of his, his older bottlings a couple times, and they are just fascinating. So I'm really excited to get there as well. But first, we're going we're gonna to go to Dennis, and I'm going to do this because I have been saving it for the, for the, for the effect. I'm going to pull, there it goes. Oh, it's coming out. <laughs> All right, Dennis, tell us, uh, tell us what we're drinking here. Um, what's up with this? How you decided to do a sparkling Riesling of all things and why San Luis Sea Highlands uh, is good for that? Um, I've always been into uh, doing the champagne method on, on sparkling wine and, and playing with odd, odd varieties. And um, Riesling just has so much floral, inherent floral characteristics that I just, I love it. It's, um, this is from Tendre Vineyard. Um, and it's just got so much tangerine, um, ta just tangerine and flowers. And um, it's just a totally different aspect than Chardonnay gives us. Um, I also make sparkling Chardonnay from the San Lucia Highlands. 
Um, but I, I like to play around with some interesting, fun varieties that we grow here. Um, and the acidity is just amazing. Everybody's been talking about the acidity of the San Lucia Highlands. That's why it's beautiful for sparkling wines is that we can get a little bit riper and a little bit more flavor and, and in, the, in the wine itself, um, but still have great acidity to back it up because you need great acidity to make sparkling wine especially. Is there a, uh, a sparkling Riesling tradition at all from the old world that I don't know about or is this like something brand new? I've, I've bumped into a few sparkling Rieslings out of uh, Germany and Austria, but, but not, not, a, not a ton. Um, but, uh, and, and a lot of them are a little bit sweeter. I make mine on the drier side, so they're, they, it really pushes that, that floral aspect and, and, and keeps, it really, um, keeps the fruit really framed. Um, so most of my stuff is like half the amount of sugar as a traditional champagne. Um, so that, that acidity really speaks. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do people react to this? Are they excited, surprised? Um, we have a whole wine club for, for sparkling wine. Uh, I think fizz is just such a fun thing. My wife and I drink a lot of fizz, so uh, we started making it. Um, I, I started by making about 100 cases of it and like in 2010, and now we're making almost 1,000 cases of sparkling. So it's is really, it, fun, uh, really fun do you, make, do you make a red sparkler too? Am I remembering that correctly? Um, I make a sparkling rosé of Sangiovese. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I also make a sparkling Grenache Rouge from Hans uh, fruit there on Hook Vineyard. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I play around with the, red, with, with the reds and a little bit more pigment going on. So it makes it for a more interesting take on, on, on those varieties. And, and how are we, uh, you know, what do people think? Do so many people come to the region expecting just to find Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and, and, are, and are happily surprised to find something different? Or are they kind of confused as to why you're not just doing that? I think people love, love different. And, um, you know, we make 30 different wines here at Odonata um, just to bring different to the table. We make Pinot, we make Chard, we make Cab, we make the traditionals and, 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 and I love them. Um, but it all, it keeps me invigorated and, and engaged to, to just kind of push the envelope and play with things that, that are off the beaten path and see what we can, see what we can find out and create. Right. Right. Great. If you ever make this with an Aperol spritzer, that would be that would be a horrible thing to do. It would take away all the. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did. Sure. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it is extremely floral, um, and 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 you know has has some of those riper fruit characters, but again, just super racy um, in structure and and in acidity, and, and those bubbles really kind of lift it all up too. So, um, yeah. really really fascinating wine. Is it hard to find Riesling in the San Sea Highlands, or is there an okay amount? Um, it's becoming less and less, I feel, but um, but I, I I do feel that there's there's still quite a bit of um, planted riesling in in the Highlands. Um, right. So, um, so makes no, sense. It's cool climate, great. So hundred percent. And I mean riesling. Some sometimes people get a little scared of riesling, but I think riesling is probably one of my favorite varieties um, out there because um, it has so many different faces, kind of like Chardonnay, where it's just got different faces and different, you know, just ju depending on where it comes from in the, in the world of, of what it is. Right. So, well, I could um, drink that all day. Let's talk about um, the other wine you've got there. Um, let me find it in my little area here. Um, so this is the, the next one is the Spike Tail, Modenata. Um, it's a 60-40 split between Syrah and Grenache from uh, the Hook Vineyard. So um, tell us a little bit about about this one. Um, so, like we were talking about with blending, we're trying to take a we're trying to take two wines and accentuate the best portions of that of both of those wines. And 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 and, and we kind of talked about it. Wines kind of have an aha moment when they get put in the right proportion to each other. Um, I do other blends where it's more Grenache heavy, and this one I really wanted to to, to push more towards San Lucia Syrah. But with that generous helping of, of Grenache behind it, um, it keeps the party light as opposed to it just being this dark and brooding thing. Um, and this just has, in my mind, this wine, um, one thing that, that the Highlands has is there's this tremendous citrus element to the wines that come out of the Highlands. In Pinot, um, I've had nine, clone 943 fermenting off of um, Eskol Vineyard um, that just smells and tastes like marmalade. Um, where it's just this intense orange peel. Um, there's, uh, there's just this inherent aspect, even, with, even into the whites, 
we get this like Meyer lemon thing with the sparkling Chardonnays and there's this real citrus brightness to, and I think it has to do with the acidity, but it's also inherent in the fruit from this region where it's just, it's a really interesting marker. When somebody blinds me on uh, San Lucia Highland Chardonnay, if you get that Meyer lemon in there, you know, you're kind of, you're kind of close to home. Right, um, right. So this wine for me has tremendous, like that orangey marmalade from the Grenache. Um, and then it's got, um, in the Santa Lucia Highlands, um, and I'm sure Bibiana can talk more to this, um, the, the, the Syrah has this real black olive and um, just very um, pretty push uh, in, in aromatically. And then the, the Highlands also, we were talking about texture, that, that wind creates just such a beautiful texture in the wine. Um, be and that's because it's making those, making those skins a little bit tougher and they're delivering those tannins essentially? I think so, I think so. And then it's up to us as the winemaker of how we're guiding those tannins into fruition. And, 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 and so you get this raw product that's really beautiful and then it's our job not to mess it up. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, this is great. I mean, it has that, you definitely have kind of a meaty core there of that Syrah, but the, the Grenache is just kind of like, wrapping around the edges of it and really kind of bringing it up and, and adding those floral character. And, I, and now you're saying the marmalade, watch those, watch that start showing up in my uh, reviews. <laughs> one of these days. Uh, well, great, Dennis, this is, this has been very enlightening. Um, let's move on over to uh, Bibiana and we can talk about uh, one of my favorite topics anytime, which is uh, cool climate Syrah. So Bibiana, um, tell us a little bit about uh, your winery and uh, which wines you brought for us today uh, and which which way should we taste these we taste the uh, younger first then older what do you think yes i think we should do younger first okay thank you too. Well, thank you for having me matt and thank you everybody that is joining us to this happy hour is so exciting to be part of this i wish i could see your faces i only see the panelists faces and i know them <laughs> so i wish i could see you all but uh, i'm bibiana i am the founder and the winemaker for catreja wines um, I obviously wasn't born in the United States. I'm born and raised in Medellin, Colombia, uh, in South America, and wanted to make wine since I was very young. So I told people since I was 14, I want to make wine. I didn't know anything about wine, um, not at all like all the people you are seeing around, like my brother-in-law. I didn't born in. I wasn't born in a vineyard. I didn't have a father that was so passionate to plant a vineyard to to hand that uh, to the next generation. So I ended up going to France. And to talk, uh, Syrah is very special to me because when I went to France, really initially, I wanted to make Syrah. That was really like my whole drive to learn about winemaking. So I ended up studying in Cognac and Bordeaux. I lived six years over there. And my first experience was in Cote Roti. And for any of you that has been in the Rhone Valley, you really like, just get fascinated by how difficult it is to grow grapes in that site. So one of the things, Matt, that um, I was very intrigued when I came to California back in 2004, was really like this uh, concept of cool climate Syrah, right? Because Syrah in the Rhone Valley is planted on areas where you really have so much sunshine, but really close to the river. So I was really, really excited to, to find Syrah in California. But I didn't feel like every single place in California was adequate for Syrah. I think Syrah, especially in Santa Lucia Highlands, has one of the most brilliant conditions to create wines that can age, but that can also be really exciting at the beginning. So what I really love the most about it is how long the season can be in Santa Lucia Highlands. People talk a lot about days between bloom and harvest. And in France, when you were more than 100 days, you thought that you reached like the perfect vintage, which is pretty normal in the Santa Lucia Highlands. It's more like 110, 120, I don't know, like depending on the vintage, like 2011 was just such a long, long season. I really feel like this weather, uh, especially at the Soberanes Vineyard, which is the vineyard that was planted by the Pisonis and the Franchonis together, as everybody knows, uh, this site just really nailed it on perfect exposure to the sun, lots of wind, enough air to really keep the grapes uh, protected from any botrytis. Uh, Syrah doesn't get any of the botrytis over there. And then just to really hang in the vines and then you have this time to taste the grapes, 
I make wines that are meant to age. So that's why I sent to Matt the 2012. Uh, we are sold out of the 2012 at the, vin at the winery, but it's always nice to really see if our promise to deliver wines that can age is there. Uh, and that's why for the auction, I decided to put a magnum of the 2012 and the 2017. So the lucky winner can really get to enjoy these wines and say, wow, this 2012, and Matt, I would love it for you to talk about the wine more than me. Um, what is this wine bringing to the consumer? Why do we talk so much about aging wines? And that really is what I love about Santa Lucia Highlands. I am right now in Sonoma County. Our winery is in 101 Ronder Park. Uh, but that is the only wine that I make from the Santa Lucia Highlands. And I just feel very fortunate every year to be able to make that wine. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the 17 is great. I mean, it's still young, you know, you can feel that it's young and it's tense um, and it's going to want that time in the bottle uh, and, and it's going to develop, I think, a lot of uh, kind of more interesting, even secondary tertiary characteristics. Um, I'm going to jump right into the 12 too, because I'm excited to try it. And I, I took a sniff and it was smelling exactly as I remember a lot of other San Lucia aged Syrahs. Uh, you know, they, they grow this kind of meaty, um, very savory quality over time. It seems to lift that, uh, the, the bottle age. And, and then a pepper just kind of comes through too. You know, it's a very yeah. strong peppery uh, grape in general and cool climate amplifies that. And then I assume your style of winemaking helps that pepper come through too. Yeah, so I, I love that you mentioned white pepper because when I was in Cote Roti and especially in France, you are really always looking for Syrah to have a lot of floral notes. So I really, I'm always trying to get that violet character, which is so hard to get when it's too hot. And then you have these kind of white pepper notes that just make the wines so complex, but then you have red fruit and then you go to earthy notes. For me, Syrah, and I, I was shocked when I came to the United States and people said like, nobody likes Syrah. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> People can pay $400 for a Cote Roti, but they will not pay $30 for a Syrah, which is the same. And I feel like it's one of the most unbelievable wines to age. Um, obviously, you have to have it at the right place. And I know everybody knows Santa Lucia Highlands for the amazing Chardonnays and Pinot Noirs that are made. But it's very difficult to find the right terroir for this kind of varietals. But the, the satisfaction that you can get with a bottle of Syrah, I think, is, is actually pretty fascinating. So. Do, do you think, I mean, we've been hoping that Syrah was going to be the next big thing for a long time now. <laughs> We're still kind of open. But is it, do you think, I know that Psalms love it. I know winemakers love it. Um, educated consumers love it. Are they, is it showing more and more potential? What do you think? Well, one of the things that are interesting for me, so I was making Napa wines for, for a while uh, as a consultant, and I realized that people just really follow this trend of, if people tell you this wine is great and it's a very expensive wine, it should be good. So what I started doing with my Syrah, which I know is an expensive Syrah, so it's a $70 retail price, so it's not like on the lower price point, but I blind taste people that say, I love Cab, I don't like Syrah. And when you put these two wines that are really well made, blind, so I'm putting a $300 a bottle of wine against a $70, people think it's cab because they were thinking she makes Napa cab. Right. So you're playing a little bit with the, I think it's a lot of a mental uh, block on people's brains. Um, I think people love the wine when they taste it blind. Uh, I actually planted a suitcase clone that I brought from France in 2011 at the vineyard that you are seeing, Mark Pisson is standing up, and he has been helping me develop those little vines for the last nine years. But we only get half of a ton every year, so we are working really hard. So the fact that I am planting a suitcase clone that I brought myself from France is really my belief that we can really be making extraordinary Syrah wines. Uh, I don't know what it's gonna take the consumer. I know more people and more winemakers can really engage into making a serious wine, it's gonna make the change. Yeah. I don't know, uh, Adam Lee has been making Syrah from Santa Lucia Highlands since, Adam, I don't know. Yeah, it's fantastic. fantastic. A long time. So maybe a question for Adam more than me, <laughs> uh, but yeah. I really hope that it will, it will go, like people will pay more attention to wines like Denny's, uh, you know, to have wines that are different, but to really understand that the appellation is just so special. 
and it's so tiny, there are not that many producers, uh, but when you find wine from Santa Lucia Highlands, I think people really understand that the quality is always right. overachieving. Right. Yeah, that 2012 is fantastic. So I encourage everyone to uh, bid on it. <laughs> raise those, raise those, raise those prices. Anyway, well, this has been great, Bibiana and Dennis. Uh, I think we've we've learned a lot. Um, thank you for having me, and thank you all for for watching this segment. Now we're going to turn it over to Kareth Overstreet from Brilliant Wines and Megan Gunderson from Walt Wines, and they're promising us some witty repartee. <laughs> Hi, Megan. Hi, Kareth. How are you? I'm well. I'm going to pour you a glass of wine here. I'm so excited that. Um, you can be with me, and I hope everyone at home is going to pour some wine with us. What do, what do you have there, Karen? Well, I have um, the Brulium Wines 2016 Sobranes Vineyard Pinot Noir. What do you have, Megan? I have the 2018 Sierra Mar uh, from SLH, which is one of my favorite, favorite places for Pinot Noir. So we're fortunate to work with Gary and Adam and Nick, and we just love working with them in that in that region so we are here to talk about what's been going on at home during this time so what have you been up to Karen? well gosh i'm like you um and like bibiana um we're the team of the working winemaker moms working from home with shelter in place um so you know i've just been doing as much winery work as i can at home um as best that i can how about you how are you finding that balance megan uh, well, it's been a little bit tough, you know, I'm, I'm getting really good at first grade math, you know, <laughs> we do a lot of first grade math and reading and uh, my oldest daughter is seven, so she's in first grade. Um, but then, you know, we've been full force, full steam ahead at the winery. So it's, I've been going into work every day, there hasn't been a break. So uh, like so many of the other winemakers, uh, we're just trying to figure out how to keep our family safe, how to keep our staff safe, and how to continue to make great wines during this time. So uh, it's been okay, one day at a time. So have you been trying anything new and different at home since you've, uh, you're have you not commuting to the winery and maybe you have a little bit more time sheltering in place? Yeah, I mean, I did try a sourdough starter. I decided it would be a good time to make bread like everybody else in the world. So getting flour has been, been an issue and I've been pretty unsuccessful, but you did share a recipe with me last uh, week from the New York Times. So... Here's the dough. So hopefully we'll be able to send you a, a picture of a well-risen loaf of bread tomorrow. <laughs> I That's swear awesome, I know how to right? ferment things. I'm just not very good at <laughs> sourdough. So I think that's the joke of it, right? There's been this shortage of yeast, the yeast that is commercially available for making bread, yet you and I are up to our eyeballs in yeast during harvest. That's like the True. great irony, huh? Yeah. Maybe we'll just steal some yeast from the winery and try to make bread with it and see what happens. <laughs> I went to a seminar actually at the Copia where um, they brought in a chef who made bread using all different kinds of commercial strains of wine yeast. Mm -hmm. So I'm delighted that you shared your dough with me because this morning, look what I made for you. Ooh, so, so of what is that from the same recipe? Like. Yeah, 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 this is the same recipe. So this is the New York Times, no need bread. And I pre-cut this, so with the magic of television, oh, this is what <laughs> it will look like for you tomorrow after you get it out of the oven with this beautiful artisanal bubbles inside. And of course, um, I can't think of anything better to have with beautiful SLH Pinot Noir. I have crumbs in my hair. Then um, <laughs> wine and some bread and some cheese. That sounds amazing. We're actually... I'm going to get together with some friends tomorrow, socially distance, of course. Um, I tried telling that to the kids, but uh, <laughs> we've decided it's time to, to get back out there safely, uh, socially. So I'm hoping that, you know, along with the great wine, we'll, we'll have some great food and hopefully a nice, nice loaf of bread. So, yeah. What else has been helping you feel normal these days, Megan? I've been doing a lot of running, a lot more running than I have in the past. I was actually training for a half marathon in July, which like everything else in the world has been postponed to December. Mm. So I may just go ahead and run that in July by myself and then go in December and pick up my t-shirt. 
<laughs> well, you can call me because I'm a distance runner too. I'm always up for um, 13 as long as we're slow enough to um, jibber jabber and talk the whole time. That sounds great. Maybe we'll plan that within the next few weeks here. I'd be delighted. So we're super lucky to make Pinot from the Santa Lucia Highlands. And it's been so fun to look in the chat box and see what everyone has been drinking. And I feel like we're so lucky to share what we do with everybody out there who has um, Santa Lucia Highlands wine on their table every night with dinner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just finished uh, blending our 2019 uh, lineup. And I would say that the Santa Lucia, the, the Rosellas and the Sierra Mar are some of the best Pinots uh, that we've ever made. So I'm really, really excited about the quality of the 19 vintage. Um, there's a lot to look forward to. Yes, absolutely. And how about any new family traditions in your house since you've been sheltering in place? Uh, you know, I just slowing down, having dinner together as a family. My kids are involved in everything under the sun. So every night there was an activity and we'd all eat separately and now that's, that's stopped. And so we can really um, spend the time and talk to them and they love to do cheers at the table and we've tried out a bunch of new recipes. So it's been amazing. Have you been doing a lot of that as well? Uh, we have. So my kids are older than yours. I have three teenagers and everybody um, is on a competitive swim team. So it's been really nice to have everybody home for dinner, probably for the first time in, I don't know, eight years. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been great. They certainly miss their teammates, but I don't miss swim mom carpool. That's for sure. <laughs> so that's been cool. nice. Carpool situations are not my favorite either. Nope. It's a drag. It's a drag. Why don't we raise our glasses to everybody who's out there? Cheers. Cheers, everybody. And with that, we're going to pass it on to Adam Lee from Clarice. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Hey, everybody. I don't know if you can see me, but I can see you. Um, thank you for uh, letting me be here. Thank you for letting me bat cleanup for this uh, SLH wine auction and the uh, event that we have. Uh, it's a thrill for me to be able to do this. Um, it is something unusual for me as an outsider to be able to come in and talk about the San Lucia Islands. Many of you know me from my days at Siduri Wines, uh, where at Siduri I got Pinot Noir from throughout the West Coast, Oregon, all the way down to Santa Barbara. And it's interesting that when I decided to start my own label in the last couple of years, my new Clarice Wine Company label right here, I chose the Santa Lucia Highlands as the place that I wanted to make wine. Uh, and that was because I love the area. I love the uh, people yeah. there. I love the farming. I love the quality of the grapes. I simply think there is no better place in the world than to, to get grapes from than the San Lucia Highlands. So that was, um, that's where my heart lies, basically. And uh, that is why I decided to name this wine after my grandmother, Clarice, and, um, and go to the San Lucia Highlands and to the vineyards there. Uh, the thing about Clarice is that it is a small label. I only make a grand total of about 600 cases, and that's split between three wines, or so many people have led to believe. I know that Matt Ketman has reviewed all three of my Clarice Pinot Noirs and has been very kind to him recently, giving him some, some very nice scores and nice reviews. Um, but there are, in actuality, four different Clarice wines. There is a fourth wine that I made one barrel of 19 cases total, and it's an auction lot wine, and I have uh, donated it to the San Lucia Highlands uh, wine auction to this event, and you can actually go on now and buy either a 12-pack or a six-pack of the, of the uh, Clarice auction lot uh, wine. It will be bottled, and all the labels will be signed by me. So it's a very unique wine, um, the rarest wine that I have ever made and uh, something to share with you. The other thing I love about the San Lucia Highlands is the commitment that we have here to helping others and to helping other people. And one of the things that came about um, in coming up with this auction and working out the details was the plight that um, 
many of our sommelier friends, people that sell wine, that buy wine, that do so much to help uh, all of us, all of us wineries. Um, they do so much for all of us and for you as drinkers. Um, they do so much for you introducing you to new wines. Uh, these people have been out of work, out of jobs. And so we partnered up with the United Sommelier Foundation, a charity that was started by Chris Blanchard amongst other people. And Chris, I know you're here and can you talk to some people about um, the United Somme Foundation? Yeah, excuse me, of course, I'd be excited to. And, and thank you to uh, SLH and Gwen for even thinking of us. Um, I had no idea I'd be doing something like this. I don't know how to, I have no idea how to start a charitable foundation. I don't, I'm not good at math, but I'm the treasurer and all these sorts of things. So what happened was, um, it was, it was two months ago, it was on St. Patrick's Day that uh, we were out to a restaurant here in Napa and they told us that, or the, the sommelier said that he wouldn't be able to work tomorrow because they were shutting down the restaurant. So we came home that night and uh, sat outside, had a, we got a new baby and a bunch of kids, you know, just like everybody. And so, you know, tense time. So I sat outside and had a bottle of wine and got a phone call from a friend in Vegas who had been out of work for about four days. And he uh, was a single father, or is a single father with two, kids and he was really freaked out and sort of panicky and not sure what to do because there was no there's really no end there's still I mean some things are opening up but it still doesn't seem like an end and so that night I, I texted I was supposed to do an event down in at Spago in Beverly Hills I texted my friend Christy Norman down there and said I'm really worried what do we do she had to cancel the event at Spago and uh, she said we should start a GoFundMe page and I'm like, I don't even know what that is, you know. So um, I got online, I looked up GoFundMe and, you know, figured out how to do it. And, um, you know, my, the goal then was to raise something like $10,000. You know, we were shooting for, you know, $200,000. Anyway, we started, started the fund up and Christy and I got a hold of some other uh, members or some friends of ours, um, which includes Master of Wine, a couple of Master Sommiers. And uh, we formed this board of the United Sommiers Foundation, came up with a couple of names and everything else. But so that's really a super grassroots how it started. Currently, we're, we're about $400,000, which just blows my mind. We used to get, you know, a $10,000 check and I would, you know, just, I couldn't believe it. And uh, the, the really cool thing about this is that, you know, I'm sitting in my house right now in my son's room and the money comes in. I walk down to the to the, to the mailbox, I get the checks that come in. I take the checks, I go to the bank with my mask on, which is really weird. You know, I sit there and wait in line and, and cash the checks, or it goes into, my, into our bank account. And then I come home and I write the checks. And these checks are $500 amounts, and they, $500 amount, they go out to sommiers from around the country. I mean, there's been a ton in New York, obviously, in Brooklyn, you know, Florida, Michigan, all over the place. I sit here and physically write out this check, and it's a it's a pretty good feeling. It really is, and I want people to understand that. You know, sometimes people have the view of sommeliers; it's always you know a sport. Maybe to there's people that you think are very elitist, or you know they're in this position of power, and everybody has a particular opinion sometimes. But to be honest with you, it's just a bunch of working people that really, really are passionate about wine and love wine, love being in the restaurant business, love studying. Like I'm a master sommelier. I spent all my own money to take these tests, you know, and, and, and work in the restaurant, you know, very hard. These are people that, you know, go into work at two o'clock, even though they have families. And then they get home at two o'clock in the morning after, you know, ser serving people and making a great dining experience. And, you know, I have, so we, we, we blindly, so this pan the panel of us, of our nine people, seven now, we actually blind look at these, uh, review the applicants that come in. And one of the part of the applicant uh, application process, obviously, is to say where you work and where you live and all that, which we don't see any of that. But the one part that we do see is a personal essay. And I, I, I just wanted to print a couple of things that really like brought me to tears and really got me. But one person simply said, I've lost everything so quickly. I now have zero income, no insurance, and I have rent and bills. There's no sign of anything opening soon. I am terrified. You know, I mean, that's, it gives me goosebumps right now. It's just, um, it's incredible what's going on with people. And the checks that we have awarded are going just for, for rent and groceries and, and to pay bills and, you know, to get gas in the car and anything else that'll, that'll help people go. And so, I mean, that's, that's the basic story. These sommeliers are the, the people in the restaurant are the first people that get let go. They're the, they're the first people fired or laid off or furloughed and they're the last people 
to be hired. And, and still we're looking at the situation going, okay, some restaurants are opening. What, uh, what's the role of the sommelier? They're still, they're still out of work and they will be for a while. It's one of those things where you could always get a job. It's that type of business, almost like wine. You know, obviously if you're, if you're a good winemaker or you're a national sales rep or something, you know, you, you have a network of people. But if suddenly all the wineries close down, what are you going to do? So all the restaurants are, are closed down now and, and people are out of work. I won't go on too much about it. Uh, but it's a very it's a very good cause, and we're so appreciative that uh, for this auction that you're you you will help us out. And as I said before, the check is going to come right to the house, go into the bank, and then go out to the sommeliers. And I'm talking about within a week, so it's uh, it's a quick process. Chris, Thank it's you. fantastic the the stuff that you've done here that it goes out to people that we have met out and around that we've all had the opportunity to interact with all of us panelists, but. Everybody who's here, who's gone to a nice restaurant that has a psalm, I mean, these are going directly to the hands of those people that we've interacted with. It's, it's really fantastic what y'all started. Thank you so much. And again, I really appreciate everyone, uh, especially for uh, SLH, to be, uh, to be donating this portion of the proceeds. It means so much to everyone. Thank you. Sure. Um, one of the things that has been added on, I mean, obviously we have the, the auction here. They're the items that you can bid on and people can get, um, you can increase the bids and get higher and higher bids on some. There are buy-in items, both from Clarice and other people where people can just go in and buy wine. But then one of the things that I think is most remarkable is this is something that we just came up with in the last 24, 36 hours. Um, the two past presidents of the San Lucia Highlands, um, Dan Lee and Gary Francione came up with a really fantastic idea so that people who maybe if they bid on an item but they didn't get it or if some of these buy-in items ran out, an opportunity where people can still work to support the USF and all of that. So Dan and Gary, can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, Gary called me this morning and said, hey, I got an idea. Um, we... Uh, Let's, uh, if somebody adds, uh, you know, donates uh, $25, $50 or whatever, let's match it. I said, yeah, hey, you're, I'm good with it. Uh, let's do it. And, uh, you know, probably first of all, we miss everybody. We miss being in front of you in person. Uh, we love your support. And uh, we just hope that everybody's healthy and is ready to, move on and hopefully move out of this uh, this uh, shelter in place stage uh, here pretty soon. But in the meantime, stay smart, stay healthy, stay, stay, uh, stay safe. So, uh, so yeah, so we're doing a matching donation. Um, and uh, so we hope that everybody supports the group. Uh, we're, we're pretty close to what we did last year with the auction and as well, you know, at the event. So we're, really close to hit, you know, hitting our goals and stuff. So um, we're, we're just trying to push us over the top for this year. So thank you for everybody for joining us today. Dan, for what it's worth, um, I just went on and it took no time at all. I donated $200. Um, I did it mainly because I've written enough checks to Gary for grapes over the years that I'm actually <laughs> enjoying may having him write a check now. Exactly, yep. exactly. Good get back to him. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Dan, for joining in um, as past presidents over the last double digit years. Uh, you and I were really going to call this the Tony Baldini campaign fund uh, in that he can, you know, we want to raise enough money so that we don't have to be presidents again, but we're going to give this to all the <laughs> And I, Gary, I think we have to have a talk after this. I think I'll be calling you right <laughs> after this call. <laughs> I think you'll appreciate this and run for four years so that you don't have to die. Because I'm challenging Dan. Him and I have a match off ourselves. And you don't have to come up with money. <laughs> and I will fight it out. We're gonna, we, we started this place, all of us, the Hans and Sonys and Dan and um, everybody uh, and we're going to keep it going and we love you and we're going to see you in 21 and everybody what a great gala happy hour thank you <laughs> thank you uh, thank you Gary and Dan um, Chris um, your your stories were, were incredible thank you for sharing those and and reminding us about the families that are behind the scenes 
um, I'm, I'm second generation in the Y business. And what, what really attracted me personally to this AVA was that it was a collection of, first and foremost, it was a collection of families and farmers. And I'm really proud to be part of it. And I think this showed today that there's fantastic wines and there's, there's, there's incredible vineyards and, and, and stories, but there's really a lot of great families behind this, whether you're making wine or selling wine, um, but there's a lot of people that are behind it. Um, and, and it was, it, I think it was a great to see that today. And that really came through. I, I want to thank every, everybody who contributed to, to the auction lots today. I mean, that, that, there were some incredible wines out there. Uh, amazing things. Um, Gwen, thanks for much for, for putting this together. Uh, it, it, was, it was a great event. I, and I, really, I want everybody to know, I'm sure you know this too, that what we do, we do because people are taking care of us at home. So this is a family business. To our, to our to our significant others that are home when we're out in the vineyard or out selling wine, I can do our, my job unless my wife and my family was out there. And I know it's similar for everybody else. So I was part of the toast, but I think we several. I just want to shout out to the families. I want to shout out to all the essential workers out there that are in the grocery stores that are that are keeping that food and that wine on the shelf and so important to us right now. I want to toast those 2020 graduates all of those, those family, friends, and relatives that we've missed out this year. Um, and and I, I really want to just kind of raise a, glow, a glass at the end of just thanking those Psalms out there. We're thinking about you. We won't forget you. And thank you for everything you do in good times and bad to promote the wines of San Lucia Highlands. So God bless you all out there, Psalms, and um, cheers and good luck. And, and put, put on some more wine. So good night from the San Lucia Highlands. Cheers. 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 Cheers, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for all your, your time and effort. So glad to have you guys here. Oh, and I see Tamara Franchoni down there. <laughs> I'd like to know what Dan Lee was cooking out there. I know, me too. Right? Uh, we got uh, <laughs> we got a couple couple racks of ribs. Uh, <laughs> St. Louis style, and um, and then um, I uh, got a um, some anchovy chicken breasts, and then I got some um, a, a three butter uh, oyster barbecue oyster kit from Hog Island. Wow. So we have an anchovy butter um, uh, anchovy. I mean a, um, a jalapeno bourbon butter. We have a green garlic butter and we have a jalapeno butter. Um, so I'm, I'm barbecuing oysters with the three butters and uh, uh, and some brunt, um, some sirloin brunt ends uh, here. Uh, you know, if you see in the pan right here. So a combination of thing. Uh, don't tell anybody we're having friends over tonight um, for a uh, we'll get together. <laughs> I'll be there too. That sounds great. Okay. Come on over. <laughs> <laughs>